suppose as long as people have been fishing, there have been fish stories. This is one of the good ones, and one you most certainly know was told over and over and over again. Good fish stories are always like that. In my generation, we grew up in Sunday school with a song that celebrated this story. Some of you remember it. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me. No, we don't have to do the song song. But <laughs> Here's what this story has meant to the church since it was first told and recorded by the Gospels. One, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all think it's a very cool fish story, and they all included it in their, in their uh, Gospels. John uh, has some other really good fish stories, just not this one. Two, it gives us the background story of how those who shaped the first century church, like Peter and Andrew, James and John, got their start. Three, based on what happened to them, it has become an invitation, that is, whenever life leaves us empty-handed, to go deeper. So, fish story, call of the disciples, and invitation to go deeper. Now let's take a closer look. Jesus has come to the shore of Lake Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus asks an up all night without catching anything a fisherman named Simon if he could get in his boat and pull away from shore so he could better address this large crowd that had been following him. When Jesus finished, he said, Okay, now let's go out a little deeper and let down your nets for a catch. Now, we should not overlook that this would be a rather uh, odd or unusual thing for a preaching carpenter to say to an experienced fisherman. But after some discussion, out they go. And you know the outcome. Net bursting, boat sinking, loads of fish. Now, for Simon, this was a holy epiphany, that is, a holy manifestation of something anyway. How do we know? It's, well, look at his response. It's not, uh, hey, fellas, uh, will you look at this? You don't see this every day. No, rather, he falls at Jesus' knees and bursts out saying, get away from me, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. That's all he can say. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of religious faith Simon had before this experience, but I have a feeling, based on some fishermen I have known, that Simon was probably more comfortable in a boat than in a pew. And that's going to change. So now our fish story shifts from, from uh, the, the, the catch of the fish to a call to ministry like our old Sunday school song, song about making fishers of men. And that, too, is a pretty amazing story. Because shortly after Simon and the others get back to land, did you notice what happened? They leave everything and follow Jesus. The boats, the nets, and the fish. You know, it's a little bit like, like if somebody had won the lottery and got it all in cash and then tossed every bit of it up in the air saying, okay, everybody, help yourselves. I've got something more important to do. Yeah, it was like that. And what they were invited to do is now fish for people. That's what Jesus said. So here it's interesting that in the Greek Bible, the word used for catching or fishing for men is zogron. Literally, it means to take alive. Hmm. Take alive. So perhaps the meaning of take, 
taking alive should be more emphasized in how we interpret this story. Now I say this because this image or the image of fishing for people so easily conjures an image of something not particularly good for the fish. Whether hooked or netted or speared, fish, when fished, don't end up so well. If they're lucky, they suffocate and die before they are gutted, beheaded, and filleted. So this might be a regrettable image to use, for example, in evangelism. <laughs> that is, fishing for new members. But see, now, that's why we got to remember, in this context, catching means to take a live all in order to draw people into God's wonderful community of faith. And, th and that's really a great image for evangelism. E see, evangelism is not trapping people against their will. It's not luring people into church by false promises. It's not pounding people into submission by hooking them with the fear or wrath of God. Zogron, rather, is good news. Good, a good news word offering people a place of safety and security where they can now grow and be healthy and where people's gifts and abilities are caught and released. You get that? Caught and released to share in God's purpose for our lives, which is to love and serve in Jesus' name. So we have a great fish story, an equally miraculous call to follow Jesus, and lastly, now an invitation to put out a little deeper, especially or, or whenever we feel like our lives are coming up empty-handed. Now I have to admit here that sometimes when we listen to these stories, or this story in particular, it's, it's easy to imagine, well, I, I see how how everything worked out for the disciples. I mean, they experienced this miracle and all this firsthand. Of course, they knew something special was going on. But where, where do, do we fit into the story? And that's why we want to make, make sure we take a very careful look at Simon Peter's own words before all this happened. Remember his words? Master we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. These are pretty much the words any exhausted person might make. Because every one of us at one time or another can identify with the feeling of toiling for a long time and coming up with little or maybe nothing at all nothing at all to show for our hard work. Maybe you've been involved in, in a home or school or work or retirement or family project that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Maybe you've been in a personal relationship for a long time and don't know where it's going or if it should even keep going. Maybe you've been in the same job for a long time and wonder if this is where you're supposed to be. Maybe you've been a parent for a long time and wonder if your children are ever going to grow up and be on their own. Or maybe you are just trying to determine in this age of pandemic-affected exhaustion what God wants you to do with your life now. And you just can't figure it out. Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. I think maybe we're all tired that way. At least some. And it's, and it's hard then when we are tired that way, to keep up with enthusiasm about life and faith and church and all these things that we know we are supposed to do or have or be. 
So what did the future disciples do going back to the story? Well, first of all, they trusted. They went deeper. They took a chance, which is good, and they were rewarded. It's a great fish story. But see, the challenge of using this as a guide for what to do when we are toiling and seeing nothing coming from it is that we might easily end up at the short end of the ought-tos. You know, that is making this be something as we ought to go deeper then into the Word of God, for example, or we ought to pray deeper. We ought to to take a little longer leap of faith, or, or we ought to open ourselves to listening to God's Word better, or we ought to risk sharing with others at deeper levels. You know, typically that's, that's where a lot of sermons like this go and where sermons like this of mine have gone. You know, which is sort of move into that good old gospel pep talk and then implying that if you or when you do these things like the disciples, you'll get a boatload of fish or at least a boatload of abundant blessings. Therefore, just trust Jesus. Now, I don't disagree with that. But when you are just so exhausted with life, as so many are these days, that is a whole lot easier said than done. But here's a very interesting observation based on this story. Even if you cast your net and it comes back filled with blessings or filled with every spiritual and material thing you would ever need to be gloriously happy, you'd probably have to leave it behind anyway. The new disciples did. Remember, they came back to shore bursting with a big hall of prosperity, and Jesus said, leave it, follow me. And they did. So that's why I believe it is accurate to observe that what this story is finally about is not what's in the nets. It's about what's in the promise. What this story is finally about is not what's in the nets, not the fish, not the people, not the blessings. It's about what's in the promises. And what's in the promise is a word from God who calls us to journey with no guarantees but these. No guarantee but this. We will never be abandoned by God. God will give what we need to make and complete the journey. And God in Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit will stand beside us and walk with us from beginning to end. That's the promise. Now along the way, there will be plenty of amazing times, plenty of of epiphanies. But certainly difficult, even heartbreaking, and exhausting times as well. It may be only when looking back we see with clarity how God has been guiding us all the way, blessing us all the way. In all this, what God promises is steadfast love and faithfulness. In every circumstance, through calm waters and stormy seas, during times when epiphanies make God so visible and so clear to us, but also when fatigue and burnout and exhaustion keep us from seeing God at all. Feeling like we are toiling for nothing. But then, too, God is always with us. For what's in the promise is this. We have been taken alive. Caught, 
taken alive by a loving God for a purpose to become children and disciples of God, trusting in all God's promises to further reach out and take alive all who are also looking for hope along with us and a future. Thus we live, and thus we love. Walking together, serving together, sharing together, and fishing together. In Jesus' name, as we are blessed. Amen.